Rover's current power units are the envy of the automotive world. The K-Series, introduced in 1989, has proved to be highly successful. The latest K development being the exciting variable valve control unit in the MGF. Then there was the fly-by-wire L-Series diesel engine at the end of 1994. So smooth and powerful, it transformed people's opinions of diesel engines almost overnight. Now the Rover engineers have done it again. This is the all-new KV6 engine. Two and a half litres of sophistication to power our large car range into the 21st century. And it's what this programme is all about. Let's start by giving you a bit of background to the KV6. It all began in 1991, when it became clear that the existing V6 engine had limitations. One of these being its inability to meet emission regulations proposed for the late 90s. And so the engineers were given a brief to start with the K16 design and produce an all-new 2.5 litre V6. It was codenamed Merlin. Merlin had to be compact, lightweight and reliable, yet outperform the current unit. And of course, it had to meet future emission laws worldwide. The rover engineers are very enthusiastic about the outcome. The engine has met all their development criteria. The result of their work is the shortest V6 in its class. It's also nearly 30 kilograms lighter than its predecessor. It has more power and torque and gives an average 14% improvement in fuel efficiency. The production build facilities have been carefully thought out too. Instead of relying too much on robotics, as is the practice these days, Rover have opted for a considerable degree of hand building. Obviously, modern machining technology still has a big part to play for production operations such as the cylinder block and cylinder head. But for final assembly, it was decided that this sophisticated engine needed a special build procedure. And a conscious decision was made not to rely on the monotony of the one-man, one-job process. So, the KV6 assembly line is manned by a small, hand-picked and dedicated team, skilled in their work and fully trained to carry out all the line operations. Every engine has the same rigorous checks at specified intervals during the build, from a careful matching of piston and connecting rod assemblies to a thorough pressure testing procedure to check for porosity or leakage. After build, each engine is put on a test bed and run for half an hour through a range of tests and at the same time inspected using special equipment for any signs of oil or coolant leaks under running conditions. Let's look at some of the KV6 features. It's all alloy to keep weight to a minimum, but strength is a vital factor too. And you'll be most impressed when you see inside it. For example, look at this substantial bearing ladder to support the crankshaft. It's made of a special alloy used in the aero industry for strength and durability. It's lineboard with the block, and if ever you have to remove it, you must renew the bolts. There's two types. The outer bolts are shorter and are torx headed, while the inners have hexagon heads. The new bolts must be fitted to their correct locations and must be tightened to the right torque in the sequence cast into the bearing ladder. As we said earlier, compactness was one of the design criteria for easy installation in transverse applications. Just look at the short length of the crankshaft. It runs on four large diameter main bearings, and the center journals and all the connecting rod bearing journals have cold rolled fillet radii to build in additional strength where it's needed. The main and con rod bearing shells are a selective fit from five different color coded sizes. The cylinder liners are the damp liner design, similar to the 1.6K series engine and are sealed in the block with Hylomar. And here you can see the cylinder numbers cast into the block. The left hand bank is numbered 1, 3 and 5 and is on the side nearest the front of the car when the engine is installed transversely. And the right hand bank is numbered 2, 4 and 6. Incidentally, each piston and connecting rod is supplied as an assembly to service. At the top end, the two cylinder heads incorporate the combustion system design, which has proved to be so successful in the K-series. Four valves per cylinder, hydraulic tappets and separate camshafts for inlet and exhaust. The two cylinder heads are identical, although the exhaust camshaft in the left hand head has this reluctor, which signals the engine position to the ECM.
The camshaft drive is very interesting. As you can see here, the drive belt on the crankshaft nose turns the two inlet camshafts and the water pump. And at the other end, these two belts take the drive from the inlet camshafts to the exhaust camshafts. We'll look at timing procedures later in the program. It's not nearly as difficult as you might think. By the way, the camshaft gears are made from sintered metal and oil is used in the manufacturing process. In service, this oil can be thrown off the gears and create a fine mist on the inside of the timing belt covers. So don't confuse this with an oil leak. Next, the lubrication system. The oil pump is in this housing, driven directly by flats on the nose of the crankshaft, like the four-cylinder K-series. The housing incorporates the pressure relief valve, this oil pressure switch, an oil temperature sensor, and the mounting for the filter. This diagram shows the circulation. Oil is drawn up from the sump by the pump, which directs it all to the filter. From there, it's forced up to a gallery which runs the length of the block and supplies the crankshaft bearings. The oil is fed through the cylinder heads to lubricate the camshaft bearings via location dowels at the ends of the block. At the front on the left-hand bank and at the rear on the right-hand bank. Now a word about the KV6 engine management. It uses a MEMS 2J ECM, the latest version of the highly successful modular engine management systems used by Rover. It provides full control of the engine's fuel and ignition requirements to ensure that both maximum power and minimum emissions are achieved. Fuel is injected by six injectors controlled by a closed-loop sequential system. The injectors are activated individually in the engine's firing order to ensure the right amount of fuel is injected to the right cylinder at the right time. Sequential fuel injection offers benefit over banked and grouped systems by ensuring precise mixture preparation in each cylinder under all speed, load and temperature conditions. Incidentally, to support this sequential injection, the ECM must know the engine's firing position. It gets this information from the camshaft sensor fitted to the left-hand head, which reads from the reluctor on the exhaust camshaft we saw earlier. The ECM also needs an engine load signal supplied by this manifold absolute pressure sensor. It's one of the most critical sensors in the system. Unlike other K-series applications, it's mounted directly on the manifold and connects to the ECM by two wires. Next, next, the intake system, which also incorporates some innovative features. We often think the most important factor in the combustion process is the injection of the right quantity of fuel. We tend to take for granted the fact that it also needs air, and for complete combustion, it must be the right amount of air delivered to the right place at the right time. A great deal of effort has been spent to make sure we achieve this on the KV6, with the introduction of the Variable Intake System, or VIS for short. The system is all new and highly sophisticated. It's been designed to maximize the engine's volumetric efficiency and guarantee its power potential at full load throughout its speed range. Let's take a few moments to outline the basic features of VIS and to look at how it works. As you can see on this sectioned assembly, the manifold is separated into two halves, with a plenum chamber for each cylinder bank. At the end of the manifold is a throttle body, housing two throttle valves, one for each half of the manifold. Separate air intake ducts supply filtered air to the throttle body from the air cleaner. Filtered air is also supplied by this pipe to the idle air control valve, fitted on top of the manifold. The ECM controls the idle speed using the IACV to determine how much air is allowed to bypass the throttle valves which are closed at idle. Incidentally, the throttle valves are preset, unlike other MEMS systems, and you shouldn't attempt to adjust them at any time in service. So now to the variable part of the intake system. These two motors each operate a butterfly valve located inside the manifold. The valves are a key part of the VIS system, and their position is controlled by the ECM. Let's see this on the engine. 
Here are the separate plenum chambers we mentioned just now, each one supplying three cylinders. At the throttle body end is the first VIS motor with its valve positioned to connect the two chambers. It's called the connect valve. At the other end is the second VIS motor. Its valve will join the chambers when required. It's called the balance valve. This simple illustration represents the relative positions of the two valves in operation. A is the connect valve and B is the balance valve. At low engine speeds or under part throttle conditions, both valves are closed. Whilst in this position, the manifold is in effect configured as two separate three-cylinder manifolds. Above approximately 2,700 RPM and with a throttle angle greater than 36 degrees, the connect valve opens. In this condition, the characteristics of the manifold are more suited to the higher engine speed and a greater torque is delivered. Between 3,400 and 5,000 RPM and with a throttle angle of more than 70 degrees, the balance valve is opened and a further torque peak is obtained. At approximately 5,000 RPM, both valves close and the manifold reverts back to the three-cylinder configuration we saw in condition one. Through careful manifold design, it's then possible to achieve a further torque peak at this high engine speed. This graph may help you to understand the improvement that VIS gives. This curve shows a conventional torque output. If we superimpose on it the VIS figures, you can see the four torque peaks brought about by changing the valve positions and the considerable improvement they give. Next, we'll look at the ignition, which, as we said earlier, is also controlled by MEMS 2J. The KV6 uses a distributorless ignition system. Instead of a conventional ignition coil and distributor, we have three ignition coils, individually controlled by the ECM. And, as you can see here, the three coils are double-ended and each provides a spark at two plugs. Each coil contains a primary winding connected in series with the supply and the ECM and an isolated secondary winding. Each end of the secondary winding is connected to a spark plug, as you see here. When the MEMS ECM switches a coil, an HT spark is generated at both its plugs simultaneously. One of those sparks will ignite the mixture on the compression stroke, the other spark will be wasted within the cylinder on its exhaust stroke. While we're on the subject of plugs, never attempt to disconnect one while the engine's running, as the huge HT voltage generated in operation has to be dissipated somewhere. If it's not able to spark at the plugs, it'll try to jump from the coil to ground. Or it may short internally in the coils and try and return through the ECM. That's likely to be to the detriment of the coil, the ECM, or both. So if you have a need to disable the coil, do it by disconnecting the low-tension lead. For the same reason, it's obviously important that you connect the plug leads correctly. To eliminate the possibility of getting them wrong, there are cylinder numbers on the valve covers, the coil mounting plate and on the plug leads themselves. Before we leave the engine management system, you'll be interested to see this new reluctor design. It's now incorporated into the flywheel on manual applications and into the drive plate on automatics. In both cases, it has six missing poles none of which are located at TDC. The ECM is still able, via the crank sensor, to determine engine speed and piston position from the reluctor. The crank sensor itself is located in the engine when a manual gearbox is fitted, but it's in the transmission housing on autos. By the way, MEMS 2J is also used on K-series engines with VVC. If at any time you have to fit a replacement ECM, you must use Testbook to calibrate it to the specific application. Next, a word about cooling. As we saw earlier, the water pump is mounted here and is driven by the smooth side of the timing belt. It's non-serviceable and is supplied as a unit. Behind it, the thermostat is in this housing, located in the V of the cylinder block. It's not available separately. The thermostat and the housing are also supplied as a unit. Incidentally, if you have to remove either of the inlet manifolds for any reason, you must first drain the coolant from the cylinder block. 
There's coolant in here, and if you don't drain it, it'll run down the inlet ports into the engine when you release the manifold. The coolant circulation works like this. The thermostat is in the inlet side of the system from the radiator, so when it's closed, it effectively blocks off circulation through the radiator. Coolant can still circulate around the engine and through the heater matrix. When the thermostat opens, the bypass is closed and the coolant has to pass through the radiator. Well, so much for the features of the KV6 engine. Now let's look at belt changing and the timing procedure. For clarity, we're showing this with the engine out of the car. As we saw earlier, there are three camshaft timing belts. The procedure to reach the front belt is a bit involved, but pretty straightforward. The auxiliary drive belt is easy to get off. Incidentally, it never requires tensioning. This spring-loading tensioner automatically compensates for any wear or stretch. To remove the belt, slacken these two nuts, securing the jockey pulley. Then use a suitable open-ended spanner like this on the tensioner to lever it against spring tension when you slip the belt off. You can now remove the other components you need to gain access to the front mounting plate, which also acts as a timing belt cover. You'll find all the instructions to do this in the repair manual. To remove the front mounting plate, turn the crankshaft until you can locate this locking pin, 18G 1746, through the block into the flywheel. The crankshaft is now in the safe position, and the pin will also hold the crank while you remove the pulley. Then take off the front plate and the timing covers to reveal the belt layout. From the crankshaft gear, around the tensioner pulley, the right-hand bank inlet camshaft gear, the water pump, the left-hand bank inlet camshaft gear, and an idler pulley. The hydraulic tensioner is a self-contained in a similar way to a shock absorber. At the rear of the engine, the timing belts are easily accessed by removing these two covers. As we said before, the locking pin, 18G 1746, holds the crankshaft in the safe position, and if you check this V-notch in the crankshaft pulley, you'll find it now aligns with the arrowhead on the oil pump housing. But, in fact, the crankshaft may still be 360 degrees out from the timing position. To check this, look at the position of one pair of camshaft rear drive gears. Each gear has two holes in it. If they are both outboard of the center line, the crankshaft isn't in the correct timing position. So remove the locking pin, turn the crankshaft a further 360 degrees, and refit the pin. The engine is now locked in its correct timing position and you can remove the front timing belt like this. First remove the tensioner, but never do it by removing this pulley mounting retaining bolt. The mounting has been precisely positioned on the back plate at the factory and must not be disturbed. Instead, remove the tensioner up a securing bolt and then slacken the lower bolt. You can now pivot the tensioner away from the belt don't forget to mark the direction of rotation on the belt if you're going to refit it. Then you can ease it off the gears. You now have to slacken the camshaft gear securing bolts. To do this, ease out both exhaust camshaft cap seals and discard them. Then fit these special tools, 18G 1747-2, stroke to hold the gears while you slacken the securing bolts, and then remove the tools. With the securing bolts loose, you'll find that the gears can be rotated a small amount. There are two important points to remember here. First, you must use the special tools to hold the gears while you loosen or tighten the bolts. Never attempt to do it in any other way because you'll cause damage to the camshafts. And second, you must discard the old securing bolts and use new ones on the rebuild. They're designed to stretch when they're tightened to the correct procedure, but this stretch is lost after the bolts have been used once, so they must be renewed. To fit the belt, 
First make sure that all the gears and pulleys are clean and dry. Then fit the camshaft gears using new retaining bolts but leave them finger tight at this stage. Then position the belt loosely over the camshaft gears and fit the special tools 18G 1747-2. To fit the belt, start at the crankshaft and work anti-clockwise. You'll probably find that the belt will try to slide off the crankshaft, so use a soft wedge like this to keep it in place. But don't forget to remove it afterwards. Keep the belt as taut as possible. And when you reach each camshaft gear, turn it fully clockwise first and then slide the belt over the teeth. If necessary, turn the gear anti-clockwise just sufficient to align the belt to the teeth, but don't turn it any further than you have to. To fit the tensioner, first align a hole in the plunger with this hole in the tensioner body. Then use a vise to slowly compress the plunger until the holes are aligned and temporarily fit a one and a half millimeter pin to hold the plunger in place. Now clean the tensioner bolts and apply some Loctite 242 to the first three threads. Hold the tensioner pulley against the belt, fit the tensioner and tighten the bolts to 25 Newton meters. Then release the tensioner pulley. And don't forget to remove the pin from the tensioner. Now check the tension of each belt span. They should be similar. If one is tighter than the rest, it means that the belt has slipped a tooth on one of the gears. When all is well, tighten the camshaft gear bolts to 27 Newton meters plus 90 degrees and remove the tools. That completes the front belt fitting and timing procedure. So now you can fit the front mounting plate. It's important to fit it correctly. First locate the plate and the alternator mounting bracket, making sure the cover backplate seals are correctly positioned. Fit the securing bolts, but leave them finger tight at this stage. This special countersunk Allen screw is fitted here at the top. First tighten the alternator mounting bracket bolts to the correct torque, then the Allen screw, and then the remaining front plate bolts. There are three different torques, and it's important to tighten them in the correct sequence as shown in the repair manual. Fit the timing belt covers, making sure the rubber seals don't get displaced. These two dirt covers and the crankshaft pulley, tightening it to 160 Newton meters. The rest of the rebuild procedure is straightforward and you'll find all the information you need in the repair manual. But if you're going on to replace the rear drive belts, don't fit new cap seals to the exhaust camshafts yet. Before you start work on the rear belts, first make sure that the crankshaft locking pin and the camshaft front gear holding tools have been removed and that the engine is still in the timing position. To change the belts, work on one bank at a time. Fit this special tool, 18G 1747, to hold the gears while you remove the securing bolts. They must be discarded too. Then note the fitted position of the gears and pull them off together with their hubs and the belt and remove the tool. Don't turn the engine while the belt is off. Before you fit a new belt, Make sure the gears, hubs and camshaft mating faces are clean and dry. Then fit the belt like this. Put the gears on the bench with the belt guide on the inlet gear facing upwards and the guide on the exhaust gear downwards. Turn the gears until the keyways are pointing towards one another and fit the belt over the gears without disturbing them. Then locate this spreader tool, 18G 1747-1, stroke between the gears Turn the center screw on the tool just sufficiently to spread the gears until the locking plate can be fitted. Don't overdo it or you'll stretch the belt. Now fit these two aligning pins, 18G 1747-5, stroke into the camshafts and use them to guide the gears onto the camshafts. 
Don't try to force the gears on. To align the keyways, use this tool, 18G 1747-4, stroke on the front of the exhaust camshaft to turn it until the gears slide into place. Then remove the aligning pins, fit new retaining bolts, and tighten them to the correct torque. This is 27 Newton meters, and then a further 90 degrees. Repeat the same procedure to change the belt on the other bank. Then remove the locking plate and the spreader and refit the belt covers. Don't forget to fit new cap seals at the front of the exhaust camshafts. One final thought before we finish. If you have to lift the engine out for any reason, you must use the proper lifting bracket. If you don't, you'll probably damage the fuel rail and other components. Initially, any work you do on the engine, apart from routine maintenance jobs, will be subject to prior consultation. And of course, electronic diagnosis will be by test book. That completes this program and your first insight of the exciting all-new KV6. Yet another innovative concept from Rover Cars.